Okay, we're continuing our discussion of classical failures and specifically I'll talk about black body radiation in this lecture. Uh, what is a black body radiator? Well, this is the definition you'll find in the text. Uh, an object capable of absorbing and emitting all frequencies of radiation uniformly. Pretty helpless uh, or useless, I guess. Um, I think what's probably more intuitive to you is to look at these types of pictures. Um, so this is actually a, a black body radiator that you can buy on Amazon. Um, it's a metal coil, which is connected to a, a voltage source and it heats up. Um, and as it heats up, it starts to glow, right? Another example of it might simply be a horseshoe. Um, so you can take a horseshoe, uh, you stick it into a fire, it will heat up and start to glow. These are black body radiators. And the specific question that we wanna answer is, how does the intensity of light at different wavelengths depend on the temperature of the radiator? You may intuitively know in this example, right? Um, let me get my screen. My first time, we'll see if I can get my, my pointer set up. Um, which of these horseshoes is hottest and which one of these is coldest, right? Uh, well, cold one's down here, right? Hot one's up here. Uh, this is white hot. And in fact, I'm told that you can even sometimes get these hotter than white hot. Uh, you can get them to be a blue hot. Right? So if it looks almost entirely blue, uh, that means it's really, really hot. So where does this come from? Well, the first people to think about these um, were named Raleigh and Jeans. Uh, Raleigh's a pretty famous scientist, uh, as in Rayleigh scattering. Um, anyways, they analyzed this problem from a classical viewpoint based on the equipartition theorem. You may remember the equipartition theorem from last semester when we were calculating heat capacities, uh, one half KT per quadratic degree of freedom. And essentially what they, they did was said, I'm gonna imagine that this radiator is composed of an oscillator, something which is shaking back and forth and, and um, producing electromagnetic radiation. And these oscillators are working at different frequencies. Right? Uh, because this is based on the equipartition theorem, right? you divide up some amount of energy equally among all of these oscillators. Right? That's the important point. The oscillators are all equally excited. When you go through and turn the crank and do this analysis, this is the result that you end up with. Um, they calculate a quantity called rho. Uh, the energy spectral density. We can think of this as a measure of the intensity at a given wavelength. Right? So this is a measure of the intensity of light. If you integrate the spectral density with respect to wavelength, right, you'll get the total energy. Um, and what you need to see in this is that it's inversely proportional to lambda to the fourth. Right? So it depends on the uh, wavelength and on the temperature of the sample. Why is this troubling? Um, well, imagine I, I took the Raleigh Jeans law and I made a plot of intensity right, versus wavelength. What would that look like? A uh, bunch of constants up here, right? one over lambda to the fourth, so it would go something like this. And uh, if I heated the sample up, right, I increase temperature, uh, these numbers would go up. Mm. It would still be asymptotic. And uh, what's perhaps even more important is if I cooled it. So if I cooled it, right, this intensity would drop but it would still go up, it would still go up and go up like this. And what I want to emphasize to you is this. Oh, wrong color, I want to do this in red. What I want to emphasize to you is this behavior here, right? Even at cold temperatures, 
uh, it can be really cold. Some oscillators are excited, right? So these are at the short wavelength, right? Um, and even if I make this thing approaching absolute zero, these short wavelength oscillators are still excited. Uh, this has a name, right? It's called the ultraviolet catastrophe. Right. Ultraviolet because there's short wavelength and it's a catastrophe because it's never dark. Right? Even at cold temperatures. Right. These are always excited. And so how do we resolve this issue? Well, people didn't really know. Right? Uh, and it took a long time to figure out the right answer. In fact, the person who thought up the right answer was this guy, uh, Max Planck. And throughout the course, I'll show you lots of pictures of these scientists. Um, the reason I do that is because a number of these scientists who made these revolutionary discoveries were quite young, right? uh, in their early 20s. And so never let anyone tell you you can't do anything because you're young and don't know any better. right? Sometimes that's a great asset. Uh, and this is an example of that. So if Raleigh genes was based on an assumption that the energy was divided equally, uh, Planck said, well, why don't I just make an assumption that they're not divided equally? Okay. How would that happen? Well, one way that might happen is to say that oscillators require some minimum energy to be excited. I don't get to just divide them all up um, because there's some minimum amount of energy that some of these oscillators have to have. And what that really means at the end of the day is that energy exists in discrete amounts. I can't just raise my pencil up some ad infinitum amount. I got to give it a, a specific unit of it. And those units are called quanta. So what Planck said is that energy is quantized. And what that ultimately means is that it's lumpy, right? It comes in lumpy amounts. Um, Planck turns the crank, and here's his result. It's shown down here. You don't need to worry about it. Um, we're not going to use it, but I want to point out to you two things. The first is that Planck's hypothetical uh, intensity his predicted intensity matches the experimental values really, really well. So he made this assumption, which at the time seemed absurd uh, to say that energy must be quantized, right? but it works really well. And um, importantly, in this analysis, when you make this new assumption, you get some new constant in this equation. Uh, so you'll see there's actually two here. The important one is H, uh, I'll talk about that in a second. The other one is C, the speed of light. But this new constant H, which shows up, is describing how lumpy this energy is, right? the amount of energy per unit frequency. Um, and this is given an important name. He was able to determine this from an experimental fit of his data. Uh, and we now recognize that it has the value of 6.626 times 10 to the minus 34 joule seconds. If you do not have this constant memorized, um, you will by the end of this course, because it will show up over and over and over and over and over again. Right? Um, it's referred to as Planck's constant, and this is telling us how lumpy energy is. Uh, okay, that was... Classical failure one, um, I will stop this one and I will talk about the photoelectric effect in the next video.